Hey, welcome to the Sustainable Music Map. I'm Leah McHenry, and in case we haven't met before, I am a wife, I'm a mother of five kids, believe it or not, uh, under the ages of 11, and uh, I'm a full-time musician, I'm a recording artist, and I primarily made my living with my music from music sales. Uh, I can break that down for you another time about how I broke up, broke down all my income and where I've made that from. Just so you know, me teaching this stuff to you here, this is my passion, this is like my side passion. I'm always gonna make music, that's who I am. That That's kind of, I do it for me and I do it because music is meant to affect the world around us. It's not just for us for selfish reasons, it's meant to be shared and to affect and be shared with others. But this, this, me teaching you what I know about how you can become successful, how you can build a fan base, uh, and absolutely crush it online right now with your music, that for me is a way bigger than me. That is my passion project and it's because I, I want to change the world with this knowledge. I know how painful it has been for us musicians when the music industry flipped over, like it, it just flipped upside down right before our eyes. We went from being able to make a living in one respect, if you were signed, you could make a good living, to uh, Napster, right? It all started with Napster and streaming and now all the now everything's digital downloads and how are we supposed to make a living now? I saw what happened to musicians. Some musicians that I come across every day have become so cynical. They're so disappointed. They've become jaded because they thought they had power to create for themselves a music career. And now it's just taken away from us. Now it's like, well, people just wanna download, they don't wanna buy music anymore. I'm here to tell you that's not true. Uh, and I can go into that another time. I've got a lot of detailed statistics and I have a lot of detailed results and I have a lot of students who are actually getting results with people buying their music because they shifted a few things in the way they think and what they're doing. Um, but I'm, I have been coming across musicians that are so upset and jaded and cynical because they don't know how they can turn this around. So I'm here to change that. And the best way that I know how to is just give you education, is just to enlighten your mind as to what you can do. This is exciting. People think this is the worst time in the music industry. It, that is a lie. It is the best time to be in the music industry if you have a plan. So I made this map, okay? And it's it's a very simple map, but it's gonna, it's gonna bring you so much clarity to know where you are so you know what to do next. Most musicians, I wanna, I wanna pretend for a minute that we are back in history, we're back in time and we're explorers and we're gonna get on a ship and we're gonna go explore the ocean. We're gonna try to find the promised land, okay? The promised land is our successful music career. However you define that, maybe it's uh, building a loyal fan base, maybe it's actually making a living from your music so you can continue making music, right? A lot of, we all need, need to eat and pay bills. Uh, maybe for some of you it is fame and fortune. Maybe it's on the you know on the bigger end of it. But I I really don't feel like that's as realistic, right? Being able to make a living, pay your bills, and eat that's realistic. We can do that. I'm doing that. The promised land is whatever your goals really are, and how if you could look back at the end of your life and go, I did it. I did. I accomplished my dreams, the thing I had inside me ever since I was a kid that I knew I wanted to do, I did it and I have no regrets. That's your promised land, okay? So I wanna pretend like we are, we're getting in a ship, it's like hundreds of years ago and we're gonna go out and explore, all right? We're gonna try to find that promised land. Now, most musicians, they, they, they don't plan for their trip at all. They literally just find a ship, get on it, and they start sailing out to Never Never Land, never to be found again. They, they have no map, they have no luggage, they have no compass, and they're, they, they're winging it. So they sail out and they're like, I just thought that if I got onto a ship and I put a, the boat on some water and I just went out there, 
I just assumed that I will eventually come across some land. I assumed that someone might come and find me and rescue me if I got lost. I assumed that, I, isn't that how it is? And I'm here to tell you that no, that's not how it is. That's, that's how it is if you want to drown. If you don't want anyone to find you, you're going to end up somewhere in the middle of the ocean near Antarctica where in no man's land, right? And that's how most musicians approach their music career and their music endeavors and, and their goals. But not you and not me, that's why we're here, is because we're going to not be like the majority of people who are out doing that and then complaining and whining as to, well, the music industry just sucks and they just ripped us off and they, they screwed us over. No, the music industry did not screw us over. We just haven't learned any skills to know how to navigate these waters in a way where we can get from A to B in a precise manner that's measurable, it's repeatable, and in a way that anybody can do it. So that's why we're here. I'm gonna give you this map. You're gonna identify where you are on this map so you know what the next step is. By the way, there's a lot of people who might be doing some right things, but they're doing it in the wrong order or they're doing the right thing, but it's the wrong timing. And they're trying to jump ahead. They're trying to get, they're trying to like navigate in a way where, okay, we're not that far yet. You're, you're putting the cart before the horse. You're trying to do ads and things like that on Facebook when you don't even have an email list yet. You don't even have, you know, 5,000 followers on your page that are engaged with you. You know, there's people trying to jump ahead and trying to get results and that won't work. So I want to, I want to give you the tools to know where you're at so we can get to the promised land. Okay, so let's get started. Let's talk about the sustainable music map. The reason it's the sustainable music map is because the whole goal is for us to be able to keep making music. If we can't even pay the bills, if we can't eat, if we can't, you know, uh, get the new instrument that we need and the gear that we need, it's going to be hard to keep making music. And the whole, so I want it to be sustainable. The idea here is sustainability. And the map part is let's find out where we are so that we know where to go. If you're lost and you're in Antarctica right now and you don't have a compass, you're going to have a very hard time finding your promised land. So let's get started. All right. So the first thing is let's just pretend here. I'm just going to, I'm going to draw a really crude looking ship. There's my really sad looking ship. Uh, and uh, oh, it's in water. Yeah. Okay. Now the very first thing we need, and let's draw a little map here. It's like, think of pirates of the Caribbean or something. The very first thing, here's X, we need is quality music. I don't think too many people will argue with this. All right, quality music. I have to bring this up because there are some people out there who say, Leah, you're, you're just saying that anybody can have, be successful. No, I'm not actually. The very first rule or requirement is that you have quality music, music that people want to hear, that touches their soul, music that moves people. That's the whole point of music. So if your skill set is lacking in even creating good music, whether it's instrumental or you're just a singer or you're a lyricist or whatever you are, if your skill is lacking at that very base, this is where you're going to start. Now, you can still 100% be successful in what you're doing, but you're gonna have to spend some time increasing your skill level. I constantly take vocal lessons. I take weekly Skype lessons, believe it or not, with somebody who's an expert. They can help me uh, increase my skill set. We always need to be increasing our skill set in one way or another, and that's very, very important. So whether you take lessons or you're getting better on you know, your DA, DAW, your software, whatever it is you're using or your instrument or your lyrics, always try to improve the quality, your skill set, because without that, we're not going to go very far. We know a few people out there. There's a few artists where we're just like, how did they get famous? I really don't know. Well, because they had a huge marketing machine behind them that made it familiar enough for people to like it. But we are not going to 
act or pretend that we are a big corporate label. We're not approaching it that way. We're approaching it as like a grassroots movement, okay? So from here on out, you need amazing quality music that can become like a little micro economy, a little micro grassroots movement, okay? And I will teach you how to make that happen later on, but this is where we begin. So quality music is number one. Nothing else can happen if we don't have music that people love, that moves their souls, that they wanna share with their friends. The second thing, which is so important that people have no idea about is a micro niche. Okay, I'm gonna to talk to you about that. Depending on where you live, you might call it niche. That's fine, micro niche sounds weird to me, but that's just me, call it whatever you want. A micro niche, and it's this concept, okay? Here's the concept. You can either be a small fish in a big pond with a whole bunch of other fish about the same size or bigger than you, or you can be the big fish in a small pond. Let that one sink in because a lot of people have not thought about this before. We are living in an ocean right now, okay? We're gonna continue with this analogy of being on an ocean, sailing through it. We are living on an ocean right now. That's the internet. It's, it's Spotify, it's YouTube, okay? Huge, vast ocean. Most people will drown and never to be discovered. Nobody will ever find us. Most people think that if they distribute their music on CD Baby or TuneCore or SoundCloud or they put it out there, that magically people will come discover them. That will not happen. Very, I mean, 0.001%. If you're a unicorn, if you're Justin Bieber who happened to be on YouTube and you went viral, most of us will not go viral, even me. I have one video that has right now 1.7 million views that's it, and that was, and, and it's never what you think it's gonna be either. That video of mine that has 1.7 million views was a crappy home recording of a song I did from a movie soundtrack. It's not high quality, there's nothing special about it, it's my own rendition of it, it was a little cover song. Of all the things, that went viral. My music didn't go viral. Now, what do you make of that? Well, what I make of that is that there's a lot of people searching for a particular song from a film soundtrack. And in fact, that particular little song was only about 30 seconds long in the actual movie. So my rendition is probably five and a half minutes long and I fleshed it out, right? But enough people were searching for that tiny little clip in that tiny little genre film that I, they found my song on YouTube, okay? And I did some things too to um, enhance those search results so that I would come up the very top of the search. I, there's a lot you can do with that. But I only know about that because I learned about micro niches, okay? Everything is a micro niche. If you think about video games or films, movies, everything is a micro niche. Let's use video games for a second. My son likes a Minecraft game. Maybe if you have kids, they play Minecraft. Okay, here's how you think of a micro niche. It's big to small, okay? Huge category, smaller, smaller, smaller to something very tiny. And you think, well, I'm coming, cutting out my market that way. No, you're not. You, if you wanna be discoverable, if you want people to find you, and not only find you, but buy from you, buy your music, you need people who are collectors and you need people who are absolutely fanatical about that little thing that you do. Um, it's not, very often that people are as fanatical about big mainstream artists. Well, they are if labels are behind it because they have the, the capital to push it out that way. But it's not very often that say, if I'm in pop and I just say, I'm just a pop artist and I don't have any twist, I have nothing that's gonna stand out from all the other bazillion pop artists, it's gonna be very, very difficult for people to find me, very difficult to find collector fans that are gonna be excited to, to buy my music on vinyl and, and buy my t-shirts and, and get in my fan club. Very few people can accomplish that. So with a micro niche, you've gotta ask yourself, what is your twist? You've gotta have something that separates you, that sets you apart. And so it's probably something that you already are, that you're already doing, that you just need to enhance more. So for me, uh, when I got into, I, I, I got into heavy metal and I wanted 
you know, my influences were symphonic metal bands. And so what I did was I started emphasizing my twist. My twist was that I have a little bit of Celtic influence, Celtic in world. So I, instead of using, you know, a piano, I would use a harp instead. Now, all of a sudden it kind of sounds a little bit more mystical, a little bit ma more magical than just a regular piano. So I started enhancing things. I started changing the instruments. The song stayed the same, but I would just twist it a little bit, you know? And I'd, and I'd learn how to vocally manipulate my voice to do little trills and things that sounded more Celtic than mainstream. And before you know it, people were calling me the metal Enya. If you know Enya, she's like a Celtic uh, kind of new age is what they would classify her as but she really is Celtic, uh, Irish, famous, sold however many millions and millions and millions of records around the world. Now, they're calling me the Metal Enya because I added that twist. So that's my micro niche. So my top genre is metal, then it's symphonic metal. Below that, it's actually female fronted metal because um, that's its own genre. And I know it's a real genre because if you look in YouTube for it, it's uh, you can get search results that bring that up. So people are actually typing in female fronted metal. And then below that, I would say it's Celtic slash folk metal, okay? So I've gone deeper, deeper, deeper into my niche. You'll, I have a whole bunch more trainings of this, by the way. I'm not gonna spend too much time here because I have a lot to go through, but I, I really wanted to give you some meat to think about this. You need to go deeper on your micro niche. That is imperative to you getting results in this map, okay? If you already know what yours is, I would challenge you, go do, go type it in Google and see if it's actually a thing. Type it in YouTube and see what comes up. Type it in the Facebook search. Are there any Facebook groups titled what you think your micro niche is? If not, I would probably say that it's not a real micro niche and you're just kind of describing your music. It shouldn't be a sentence long. It should be a few words long, okay? Celtic metal bluegrass, folk, acoustic folk or something, okay? That's probably a real thing. If you can find a Facebook group or a fan page or you get search results in YouTube, you're on the right track. So the key is to not be too broad and you also don't wanna be so specific that it doesn't exist, okay? There's a fine line there and, and, it, no, and by the way, you might not come up with that today. It took me like two years to figure out mine. I've kind of figured out the shortcut way in my courses to be able to narrow that down, hopefully to a couple of weeks. Some people find out they know right away and getting a lot of feedback from others. For other people, it's not going to be so easy because you're very eclectic and you have all kinds of influences and your, your music is all over the place. Uh, one thing I'll challenge you now is pick one genre and stick with it. Okay. If you do five different things and you're in five different bands, you need to streamline this. Okay. And you need to stick to one, one kind of music and it's like a business. If Apple came out with a hundred products right out of the gate, they wouldn't sell any. They didn't start out with a hundred products. They started out with one. I don't even know what the original, the, the one, the Apple computer was the one product they came out with. And they didn't expand that for years, decades maybe. I don't even know how long. They only sold one item. It was a computer. Okay. And then Later on, after that was very, very successful and, mo and people knew all about it, then they expanded to other types of products. And that's the same for you with your music. Uh, you can definitely do side things and side projects and, and other genres, but not yet, not until you're successful with one, okay? Be focused. All right, the next one is once you have got your quality music and you understand your micro niche, the next thing is going to be learning how to utilize social media and free traffic. Okay, I'm gonna write this down. Okay, social media and free traffic. Basically, social media is free traffic. And most, most musicians don't understand the point of social media and they're not using it in a way that's even really beneficial. And I think one of the biggest mistakes I see with social media is people are using these platforms to basically spam people, okay? So they're inviting all their friends and family, come like my page, come follow me, come follow me, right? And then they're uploading their music all day and they're just like, promote, 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 promote. 
right, to everybody hoping that, again, someone will come across them or it'll go viral or something. They completely miss the point of what social media is about. And I'm going to challenge you to think about this from a view that's more focused on psychology, okay? If you get social media right, you will get all kinds of free traffic. And I don't want you thinking about using paid traffic, which we'll talk about later with Facebook ads, until you master this. Because if you don't master free traffic, you will not get good results with paid traffic. Makes sense, right? Okay, with social media, the entire goal of say a Facebook page, and I'd say 99% of you need to be have a professional uh, Facebook page. The whole goal of having that is not to promote your music. I'm gonna tell you something that probably nobody else is ever teaching in the music industry here. The goal of having a Facebook page and uh, even Twitter and, and say a Snapchat or whatever is to build culture and community with your music, okay? It's actually around your music. So your music is the center, but you are building culture and community all the way around it, okay? And your music is just slipping nicely right into, into the mix of it all, okay? If you end up going to my Facebook fan page, uh, as an example, you'll see that I only post my music on my page maybe one out of 10 posts. So like maybe 10 tops, maybe 20% of the time. It's unbelievable. And you're gonna be like, what the heck? The reason I'm doing that is because there's a saying in business where people come for the product, but they stay for the community. And I want you to start thinking of your music this way, not as a product, but as that your music is the thing that you would love to promote, that you would love for people to you know, gravitate toward and share, but they're gonna stay for the community. This is some high level deep stuff that I don't have time to go into completely today, but I want you thinking about this and writing this down. What kind of culture, what kind of community can you build around your music? What does your music represent? I'll give you just a couple of examples and we'll move on. I think country music is easy. It's easier to talk about because immediately some pictures come to mind, right? Let's say it's like, you know, old school country music. I'm not a country music person, so forgive me if I, you know, I don't want to stereotype, but it's, for me, it's easier to think about this. Old school, say, bluegrass country music. I'm picturing cowboy boots, I'm picturing ranches, I'm picturing horses, I'm picturing trucks, I'm picturing, what else, beer, I don't know, all kinds of things. Whiskey, maybe, I don't know. Um, you know, guy, the, the good old boys working on the farm, it's kind of, you know, there's a certain culture that surrounds it. And there's certain things who, there's certain um, interests that people who are into country music and say that particular style, there's things that they would enjoy. There's, there's things that would entertain them. There's things that they would find informative that they would wanna share. So one of the things about social media is that it must do one of these several things. It must entertain them, it must inspire people, or it must inform them in some way, like something interesting. So the, the bottom line here is it's got to be interesting to people. If what you post isn't interesting to people, it won't even be seen in the newsfeed. Facebook's algorithms are so smart. They know right within a few seconds of you posting something, if anybody is gonna be interested in it. If it's not interesting, that means it's not being posted in the newsfeed. And when it's not posted in the newsfeed, you get zero engagement. And then people go, oh, Facebook is ripping me off, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, blah, 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 and the algorithms and, uh, you know, it's all set against me. No, you're boring. No, <laughs> I won't say you're boring, but what you're posting is boring. It's not interesting enough to people and it didn't build culture. It didn't entertain anyone. It didn't enlighten or inspire anyone. It didn't inform anyone as to anything that they were interested in. So I'm just going to use my Facebook page as an example. There's lots of other pages that do a great job of this. Instagram accounts, there's some of the bigger Instagram accounts you'll see, they do a really good job at doing this. They've, they've built kind of a culture around one thing. So they're very focused around one, you know, say a jewel, jewelry, and, but they don't just post jewelry, they'll post like, you know, travel photos that 
kind of have to do with their jewelry or maybe, you know, where they found the little gems on the beach or something. So with my music, it's Celtic metal. I post all kinds of like fantasy inspired things. I post things like travel, like magical looking places in the world. I post a lot of things about dragons and, and you know, some of it's really cheesy. And I had one photo that I posted and this, I did not expect this, but it was a really silly cartoony looking photo of some dragons and they were just different colors and different styles. And there's like eight of them. And, you know, blue one and a red one and a silver one and a black one. And, you know, and I said to them, so I posted and I said, uh, which one's your favorite or which one would you like as your pet? And I said, I think I, I would choose the red one or whatever it was. And the, I mean, there, I really didn't think twice about it. I found the photo on Pinterest and that thing went pretty viral on my page. I think it had like nine, 9,000 shares or something crazy like that. I mean, it was crazy. For my page, that that was a very, very viral thing. That's the most viral thing I've ever had. And you'll find out from me later on that a share is a lot more real estate than a like. I Likes are okay, but a share is way more valuable, okay? When you can master this free traffic and people sharing things, uh, sharing your music, sharing things that are coming from your page, then you might be ready to go more advanced Okay, with like paid traffic, which I'm a huge fan of. I build my fan base year round using paid traffic, using paid advertising to attract highly, highly targeted people to my music, which then I market to them through email and other things. It is so exciting. I mean, oh my gosh, if I had known these, this stuff like even five years ago, I'd be way further ahead. I'm so excited for what people can do right now, but it's imperative that you master these things first, okay? I already talked about this, but I'm just gonna put it on here. It's culture, okay? Culture and this go hand in hand. If, you just, if you're just like posting your music, if you just put your music out, I mean, to your friends and family, sure. They'll like it, they'll buy from you, but you know, we only have so many family members and friends to go around. It's imperative that you learn how to build a culture around your music. That's the difference between success and failure. I really do believe that that is one very big thing and that the culture is very distinctive around your micro niche too. Like I'm not just posting whatever. I really think about what I post before I post it. And I try things and experiment and not everything, not everything is a winner. And you go, oh, I thought that, I thought for sure that photo would get a hundred shares and it only got two, okay all right, I learned something. Okay, cool. And, and, and it's just a series of tests and a series of experiments. And with the creative mind that you have, it's all part of the fun, I think. Along when, when you have got some of these things down, I'm gonna put on here branding, okay? I'm gonna tell you something very important that I learned. Branding is not your logo. Branding is not your face. Well, it could be. Branding is who you are, it's you, the music itself. All of these things, the quality of the music, the micro niche, what you're posting in your social media and the culture you represent, it needs to be congruent. Congruent means consistent, that from start to finish, when they go from Twitter to your Facebook, to your website, to your email list, to your YouTube channel, that it's all similar and they know it's the it's the same artist it's the same person okay so if you, what would be bad is if they went to your facebook page and they're seeing like a whole bunch of like maybe political articles that don't have anything to do with the culture of your music it's possible that it could by the way depending on what kind of music you make but if they're seeing a bunch of weird political arguments and then a picture of a cat Cat pictures are usually very good though, <laughs> but it just makes sense. And then they go to your website and it's, oh, there's like, you know, these photos and there's like a colors, there's like a theme going on, but that theme you don't find anywhere else. You're not congruent and your branding is gonna be extremely confusing to people. So something I'm really working on for me is consistency and congruency between all of these different things that it all makes sense and that I'm not confusing people by having radically different looking things. Even my, my album cover art, every, each one of the covers 
looks very different, different colors, different photos, but there's a theme going on. So you can tell this is the same artist. I kind of don't like it when I see bands where like the first album is like a cartoon looking picture. And then the second one is a very serious photograph. I'm just like, is this the same band? I don't know. It doesn't look like the same person. So think more about congruency between these things. All right. And the last thing that is absolutely imperative in this foundational part is you need to understand how to launch your music online. Okay. Writing that down now. And this is probably one of the bigger ones. You could do what I did, which was essentially upload my music to YouTube, all the streaming free sites I could, uh, and press publish and go, I just marketed. And then absolutely nothing happened after that. That's what most people do. They think, oh, if I'm everywhere, if I'm on Amazon, I'm on Google Play, and I'm on Spotify, and if I'm everywhere, that means everybody can find me. No, that is, that's not what's going to happen. It means that nobody will find you because the question is, okay, you want to launch a song, you want to launch an album to who, who knows about you? Does anybody know you exist? Does anybody know that you're on the map of planet earth? This is the biggest struggle. This is why all of these other things here matter so much because if you don't have an audience to launch your album to that are like eagerly waiting, they're salivating, can't wait for your music to come out, what's gonna happen? Nothing, nothing will happen, okay? Maybe some random person will stumble across your music, that's great, but that's called hope marketing where you hope people will come across you. You hope people will discover you and that something amazing, magical will happen. That is not marketing. Marketing is not putting a poster up on a wall saying, come to my gig. That's not marketing. Marketing is very strategic. It's measurable, it's repeatable, and it's scalable. Meaning if it works, you can increase what you're doing and therefore increase the result. One thing to note with this, and I'm going to talk about this more in the next section here in part two, is that I actually perpetually launch my music. I am, I am always launching my music. Okay. And you might be like, what do you mean? I mean that people are like, well, how do I relaunch my music? Can I relaunch old music? Yeah, you can. You can because every new person that discovers your music, you just launched your music to them. Okay. You've got to stop thinking in terms of what the labels used to do, which is a big, huge release party and bam, we've hit the publish button and kaboom. Oh, we're going to, we got to get sales in a certain amount of time frame and a little window so that we can land on a chart. Charts don't really matter anymore. Like it's nice for credibility. It doesn't really do anything for your bank account though. Like just cause you end up on a chart. Okay. It's like being a New York times bestseller. Do you, do you know how you get on the New York Times bestseller list? It's not by selling millions and millions of books. It's by selling a certain quantity of books within a certain window of time. That's how you get on the New York Times bestseller list. Now there's a lot of things you can do with that. And it's very similar to the, in the music industry, the way you get on a chart, say the billboard chart is the same thing by selling a certain amount of volume in a certain window of time. Okay. So if you were to sell CDs way too soon or way too late, it doesn't go toward that window of time. Being on a billboard chart, if that's your main goal, you have the wrong goals in my opinion. I mean, that's fine. But if you're looking to be an artist that's trying to be sustainable, being on a chart doesn't really do much for you. It just doesn't. I've, I've been on the chart once, you know, in one of the indie charts, I don't even really care about that because I have so much, it's so much more rewarding and fulfilling that I have super fans who are just love the music I make. That's way more fulfilling to me than being on a stupid chart, right? So how to launch your music. Now there are specific ways and, and I, I do, I do encourage you to do a professional launch and there's a uh, strategic phases to doing that right. But then after that, for like an evergreen scenario, an evergreen means it's sustainable. It's on 24 hours a day. Um, we're going to talk about in that in part two, 
And this is the part where a lot of people jump, try to jump to the automation phase of that and they do it in the wrong order and it's the wrong timing and they haven't got all these things in place and it's a disaster and they waste their money. So we're gonna talk about that in part two. There's not really a lot of room for me to write it, but I'll put it, this is, this whole part is the artist, the artist identity. And I don't know if it's, I have enough room, but infrastructure. Okay, sorry, got, you can't really see it at the end, but we'll have it on, we'll have it on the download for you, okay? This section here is the artist identity infrastructure. This is the foundation you're gonna build your house on, okay? If you try to do a whole bunch of advertising and social media traffic, but your music isn't very good, well, you're not gonna have a lot of success. If you, uh, feel like, oh, our branding is really congruent. It looks amazing on our website or YouTube. Like if you go to cross, if you go to the different channels and platforms are, are, we're on, it looks really good. It's very consistent, but you don't know your micro niche. It's gonna be really hard to attract the fans that are already looking for your music. You're gonna be lost in the ocean. You're gonna be in Antarctica somewhere where no one can find you. If let's say um, you have quality music you know your micro niche, but you don't know your culture. You haven't created one. You've never thought about your culture. It's going to be difficult to launch your music and do a big launch and make good amount of money to sustain your art. All of these things are kind of interdependent. It's like a little ecosystem. And you need to kind of approach this from like a green perspective, okay? Sustainability is what we are after. All of these things are imperative and very important that you get all of them. This was part one. I hope this has been very enlightening to you. And let's continue with part two. We're gonna get into some very interesting things and this is where we are gonna be going, where we're headed, okay? Once you nail down all of this, you're gonna be miles ahead of all the other artists out there. And you are well on your way to having a very sustainable, very successful music career.